Hello, world history students. This is Mrs. Politsky. I have your notes for Chapter 32, Section 1, South and Southeast Asia. Number one, Jawaharlal Nehru became India's first prime minister uh, shortly after India was declared independent uh, in roughly 1947. Um, he held or helped develop principle called the principle of non-alignment, uh, which is basically a term that was used to describe India and other nations during the Cold War that did not ally themselves with either the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, in other words, rather than siding with uh, the democracy in the U.S. or the communist state in the Soviet Union, uh, they just kind of said, we're in the middle and we're not taking sides. Under Nehru, uh, he basically made some different changes. Uh, he increased the legal rights of women in India. He also improved life for the poor, particularly when you talk about um, discrimination that had always been based on the caste. Matter of fact, uh, during his uh, his tenure in office, uh, he made the caste illegal. But, you know, something like that was so deeply woven into um, the culture that there's still elements of that that still exist today, even though by law it's deemed illegal. It's it's kind of hard to change the hearts of people. Anyway, he also emphasized the need for unity and economic development. By 1966, his daughter, Indira Gandhi, no relation to Mahatma Gandhi, just so you know, uh, became the prime minister of India, and she served basically four terms. 1984, uh, in the Indian state of Punjab, uh, a small group of militant Sikhs occupied the Golden Temple, and under Indira Gandhi's orders, they were driven out. As a result, hundreds of uh, people were killed at the temple, and a lot of the sacred items that were there that were important to the Sikhs were destroyed. So in an act of vengeance, uh, in October of 1984, Indira Gandhi was assassinated by her own Sikh bodyguards. Uh, and this eventually touches off a wave of anti-Sikh violence that's going to occur in India. Her son, uh, Raji Gandhi, the son of Indira Gandhi, eventually serves as prime minister from 1985 to 1989. And he helped encourage private enterprise and some foreign investment, which also helped grow the middle class. Like his mother, uh, he also faced opposition in 1991. Uh, while he was campaigning for re-election, he was assassinated by a group of people known as the Tam Mill uh, Tigers. Uh, this is a group of militants who were from Sri Lanka, um, primarily Buddhist militants, um, who are eventually going to wage war for a period of time that only ends here in the last, you know, really the last 10 years or so. Some challenges in India. Um, you know, India is facing and has been facing a growing population. It's believed that probably in the next 10 years, India is going to surpass China as being the most populous nation in the world. And there's a lot of questions about how India is going to be able to meet all of its needs. Uh, other issues, poverty, uh, worsening poverty. There is a huge divide between the haves and the have-nots. And India, you know, it's it's you know, establishing itself as a growing economy, but it's not necessarily fully developed. And hence, that is going to be an issue. Uh, there's ethnic conflict. This is something that's been going on forever, it seems like. Uh, differences when you talk about religion, uh, differences when you talk about uh, social classes and such, all this is going to be a problem and is a problem. And then religious strife. So, Moving on, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about another nation, uh, primarily in Southeast Asia, known as Cambodia. In 1970, Cambodia's ruler was a guy named uh, Norodom uh, Sinanuk, who happened to be the king of Cambodia. And when he was traveling, primarily to the country of China, was visiting uh, Beijing, he was ousted as the ruler of Cambodia in a coup d'etat. 
And he was backed by a man who was supported by the American government and American military, uh, a military officer known as Noel or Lon Noel, uh, which is kind of weird. If you look at his name, it's kind of like a mirror image, kind of like Nacho Cat. Anyway, um, needless to say, uh, this was a was kind of a shock to a lot of people because of the fact that it happened so suddenly. Uh, not to say that Noel had uh, great support. I mean, there were people within India that were very upset. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, the timing is kind of important, this is all happening about the same time that the war in Vietnam is occurring. And the United States, uh, to attack the North Vietnamese, had actually been bombing parts of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that were located in Cambodia. And having the support of uh, Lon Noel, uh, would certainly kind of aid that opportunity to continue that bombing process. Uh, when you go back and you look at um, basically what Xi Nanook uh, allowed, uh, the American official that had actually approached him and he kind of agreed to it, but in public he kind of denounced what the United States was doing. So obviously we were wanting to get rid of his um, wishy-washiness by allowing somebody to come into the power that would probably support the United States government. Needless to say, Noel was not really all that popular among the people, and there was a growing level of resistance. As a matter of fact, there was a number of Cambodians who were communist. And by 1975, you know, the war in Vietnam is over, but the rise of a civil war that's going to happen in Vietnam is beginning, and not only in Vietnam, but also in Cambodia. And so in 1975, uh, Lon Nol is going to be ousted from power, and a group of people known as the Khmer Rouge are going to come to authority in Cambodia. Uh, just so you understand, Khmer is kind of a, a name of a, a group of ancient people that used to live in Cambodia many, many, many hundreds of years ago. But when we talk about the word rouge, it's kind of a French word. Uh, rouge in French means red. Uh, so if you've ever heard of anybody putting on makeup and they put on their rouge, that's what we're talking about. So if you know a little bit about communism, the color of communism is red. And so these are the, the red communists located in Cambodia. Anyway, they cause a lot of devastation for the next several years in Cambodia. And their leader happened to be a man named Pol Pot. Uh, Pol Pot uh, was what I would call a real thug. Um, you know, he kind of was born into some some wealth and privilege, and along the way, he kind of slipped up and made some stupid mistakes. And the next thing you know, uh, he's kind of on the outs, uh, even with people of his own class and background. And he finds um, basically a group of people who support him who happen to be the communist and they groom him. And along the way, he kind of rises up in leadership until we get to about the 1960s, 1970s. Um, by 19, the early 1970s, this is a man who is a leader within the Camer Rouge and he comes to power basically becomes the leader of Cambodia in 1975 and through about 1979. And his real goal was to kind of like turn Cambodia back to the, to the old times. Uh, he really wanted to make a rural agrarian society. And he basically, anybody who had any kind of influence with the West, meaning people who wore like, blue jeans and t-shirts and listened to rock and roll music and and spoke English or had actually gone to college and were intellectuals, uh, he wanted them disposed of. And so he carried out uh, basically what is known as the Cambodian genocide. Um, it's estimated that somewhere between maybe 25% of the entire population of Cambodia was killed during his time uh, in leadership or time in office. And what's interesting is there's still people that are coming to trial uh, for the war crimes that they committed uh, during the era of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, just so you know, Pol Pot will be ousted from power 
roughly about 1979, the beginning of 1980. And uh, what's weird is our old king, uh, Norod Um Shinanuk, is going to become your leader again uh, until he dies some years later. Anyway, number eight, a 1962 coup, another coup d'etat, led to military form of government in the country of Burma or Myanmar. Um, it was pretty brutal. And a lot of it was kind of mirroring some of the things that was happening in its neighboring countries. When we talk about what happened in, in Vietnam and what was happening in Cambodia and, you know, not to forget Laos and, and such. Um, what's interesting is there were some people that were upset by that and probably one of the most um, outspoken individuals about this um, military form of government in Myanmar was a woman named O oh San Suu Kyi. Uh, she became the head of an opposition party that was basically leading a movement for democracy. And she had actually had a political victory in 1990, but the military government didn't want to give her her power. And so uh, O oh San Suu Kyi was placed under house arrest. And you know, for the most part, her voice was quieted um, because she was a fighter and a, a very outspoken person for um, for peace. She was eventually awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991, but she was in jail. Uh, she couldn't actually go and receive uh, the prize. And matter of fact, she was not released from house arrest until the year uh, 2010. And as a result of being released, uh, eventually there would be new elections that would be held, uh, and she would be elected the foreign minister of Burma. Uh, she would eventually, in 2016, uh, get herself in some hot water uh, because she faced a lot of scrutiny for her handling of the treatment of a group of people known as the Rohingyas. Uh, these are a group of Muslims who actually probably were more likely tied to Bangladesh, which is a neighbor of Myanmar, but they happened to be living in Burma. And these people had been oppressed. As a matter of fact, they had been treated so poorly, you could probably start talking about things like genocide and such. Uh, and needless to say, here she goes from being you know, kind of on the pedestal of peace to having a lot of people say that, you know, she probably doesn't deserve that peace prize. And there is a lot of talk about um, basically taking the prize away from her uh, because of this treatment of, of those people who were in the minority. In the Philippines, going back to the 1980s, uh, the Philippines gained their independence from the United States in 1946 following World War II. Uh, though I will say this, the United States had a, a fairly large presence in the Philippines for a number of years after. Uh, the American military had a number of army bases and naval bases and such in the Philippines up until about the 1980s, 1990s. But, you know, the Philippines kind of kind of had some corruption, I guess. And in the early 70s, a man named President Ferdinand Marcos uh, came to power. And he was a real jerk. I mean, he was an authoritarian dictator. He used martial law, which is uh, the best way to explain martial law is like being put on the worst curfew you can ever imagine. Uh, he arrested his opponents and he stole millions of dollars from his own nation. Uh, this is that part is probably the, the part that gets a lot of people really irate. Uh, part of it being his wife. Uh, and I'm, I want to use this photo. His wife, Imelda Marcos, who you see there holding uh, what looks like a weird chrome high heel shoe. Uh, it's actually a telephone uh, that she's holding in her hand. This is, you know, but it's made like a high heel shoe. I suppose it's kind of like circa James Bond. But needless to say, when the Marcoses were... Um, you know, got to a point where the people were so mad at them, uh, they're eventually going to try to, to force them out of the country. Um, the people of the Philippines raided the Marcos's um, living quarters. And what they found is that Imelda Marcos had a shoe fetish. Uh, this woman had uh, you could imagine thousands upon thousands of pairs of high heel shoes. Uh, just so you know, when the Marcoses fled 
um, the Philippines. They ended up in all places, the United States. They actually lived in exile uh, on the island of Oahu, which is basically where Honolulu is. And there's a reason why they went there. One, there's a large Filipino population that lives on the island of Oahu. Uh, so they, they had support there from, you know, people who loved them. Uh, but needless to say, um, this opens the door for an opportunity for more leadership. Uh, starting in the 1980s, um, Ben Aquino uh, would be a rival of President Marcos. But because of the fact that Marcos was afraid that Aquino was going to, to win, uh, he was assassinated. And as a result, in 1986, Marcos, uh, under a lot of pressure, had to allow for some elections. And Aquino's wife, Corazon Aquino, who you see pictured kind of on the bottom right hand side, was actually elected president. And as a result, uh, the Aquinos and other leaders um, have had to struggle to kind of return the Philippines to the uh, democracy. Uh, currently, the Philippines have a, a leader who is kind of a thug. I mean, he, he claims that he's going to be tough on crime, but he's also you know, kind of tough on a lot of opposition. So thank you very much.